Welcome to another in the mail and if you're new to the channel I should mention that this is the most popular type of video I publish on this YouTube channel. I guess many people agree that it's exciting to find new tools, bits and gadgets that we can use to equip our hobby workshops. And I'm going to get this mailbag started with a bunch of mechanical fasteners. As you may know from previous videos I tend to order these little bits and pieces from AliExpress just because of the wide selection range available there and good enough quality for my purposes. I got some of these brass M3 standoffs to replenish my stock of uh, standoffs in this uh, assortment kit. I got some of these red insulating paper washes again to uh, replenish my stock I have in this assortment kit and I'm using a lot of these in some prototypes I'm building for a client. I like how these provide like this small cushion for a mounting screw going over a PCB. I got some very standard M3 Phillips by 5 mm long uh, screws. These again are going to replenish my M3 screw assortment kit which you see here. And uh, something new in my uh, kit, I bought a bunch of these uh, self tapping screws in different sizes and these small ones are M2.6 with a hex head and these ones are M4 uh, with different lengths and again with a hex head. And I'm planning to use these for assembling 3D printed enclosures, again for a prototype I'm building for a client. On AliExpress these took like less than 5 minutes to find and to order, whereas ordering locally I would have been stuck with minimum order requirements, more expensive shipping costs, and I'm not even going to consider going to the local hardware shops for something like this because I'm not going to find everything I need easily and it's going to take hours instead of minutes. Uh, but also getting them from AliExpress is going to take a month or so. Anyway, enough ranting, you'll find links for all of these in the description below. Next up I have some of these metal switches which I got for a particular fun weekend project. So my son is two years old and is a big fan of construction machinery, excavators in particular. He has this toy excava excavator he rides all day but it's just a basic model, doesn't do anything fancy. So I wanted to surprise him and upgrade it. So I took it into the office one day and I installed some LED headlights, tail lights, or a yellow warning light, some indicator lights on the dashboard and a couple of switches. And then under the hood I installed a microcontroller driving one of those SD card MP3 players modules with a speaker and a vibrating motor attached to the inside of the uh, chassis. So the excavator now has lights, it plays a warning backup sound, it flashes the yellow warning light and vibrates like an engine is running under the hood, which got the little guy pretty excited about the whole thing. Now the original idea was to use some of these more fancy metallic switches uh, which have an integrated uh, status LED light together with uh, this motorcycle ignition uh, key switch so that you, he would have like a real key switch on the excavator and I also planned to use this uh, real yellow emergency light unit uh, which is the reason why I ordered all of these However, uh, placing the order for these uh, during Chinese New Year meant they took like two months to arrive. So in the end, I ditched the idea and, and um, completed the project with parts that I already had. So these will either get used in another round of upgrades or maybe in a future project, uh, maybe in a future upgrade of that excavator. Next, I got myself a set of these very basic, uh, cheap uh, drill depth stop rings. And uh, they is come in different sizes so that you can install them on different width uh, drill bits. And their task is to drill, uh, is to help you drill blind holes, basically to stop you drilling at a certain drill depth. These are probably, uh, I mean, there are probably higher quality um, solutions out there. I think there are even special drill bits with a stop ring integrated like a stop collar integrated into the drill bit. I've seen carpenters uh, use those but I, I just went for this cheap multi-size option from AliExpress which is going to be good enough uh, for me. Next up I have some pogo pins. So for those that are not familiar these are spring-loaded pins that are typically used in test fixtures and this specific model part number is P75A2 and has this cup shaped end which makes it ideal to be used when you need to make contact with the end of a male pin as I'm showing here. 
So you can imagine your PCB has some through hole parts. There will be a bit of the uh, of the pin from the through hole part sticking out on the backside of the PCB. So you could have these pogo pins made with that. In fact, I'll have an update soon on my automated test fixture part one video. So stay subscribed for that. Also related to my automated test fixture video, which I'll link on screen right now so you can check it out if you haven't seen it already. If you remember, uh, this board was uh, based on this Raspberry Pi Zero. So I was exploring various options for connecting the Pi Zero to the motherboard, uh, the USB hub that I designed. And at the early design stage, I didn't know which way I was going to uh, connect it. So I, I also ordered this 40 pin IDC header but as you can see here, I ended up plugging the uh, Raspberry Pi Zero directly into the mainboard into this female header. I also didn't know how the USB interface of the Pi Zero would connect to the USB hub. So I got these various uh, USB cables for doing that. These had to be micro USB on the Pi Zero side and then uh, either USB type B or USB type C to connect here on the mainboard. But I ended up uh, using these uh, pogo pins to bring the USB connection to the mainboard, which made it much more elegant. I didn't know if I was going to need a uh, cooling solution for the Pi Zero, so I also ordered this um, uh, passive uh, cooling heatsink. Same as always, you'll find links for all of these items in the description below. Next up, a few more wiring items and uh, these guys are 3-pin uh, cooling fan uh, connectors. So if you order yourself a cooling fan like this one, uh, which comes like this without a connector attached, you can just snip one of these off and solder it to the wires of the fan and just turn it into something like this. Uh, which will connect to any standard 3 or 4 pin uh, cooling fan header uh, that is typically found on computer motherboards and in my case I'm using that on a project I built. So you can also crimp your own connector and, and just slide it directly into the casing. It's just sometimes more convenient to have these pigtails around uh, and not have to mess around with the crimp tool. And yes, I know that you can order these fans uh, with the connectors uh, directly attached, but you know, you get what is available in stock. I also have these uh, JST SH one uh, millimeter pin pitch pigtails in six pin and 15 pin variants. And I like using this type of connector because it uses uh, less space on a PCB design while still providing decent current carrying capability. So you've probably seen these in a lot of my projects. The Voltlink, for example, uses one of these uh, six pin pigtails just in a shorter form. And here I have some pre-crimped wires. These are 40 centimeter long um, AWG26 compatible with JST PH 2.0 millimeter pitch connectors. These are great for making your own pigtails if you already have the specific housing for a specific pin count. So I got these uh, in five or six different colors uh, for building a custom pigtail for a project. Also in the wiring department, um, I think it's not the first time I'm showing these, but just in case you missed it in a past occasion, this is an ATX PSU power on switch. So it gives you this female header uh, that connects to your ATX uh, PSU harness. And on the other side, you get this illuminated switch that just shorts the power on signal to ground to turn on the PSU, but in a nice uh, safe way. So this is really useful if you do any kind of work with ATX PSUs outside of their original intended purpose. Next up I got two more colors of UV curable solder mask and I think I now have all of the commonly available solder mask colors. I have yellow, blue, red, green, black and white and I use these for repair purposes for whenever I have to bodge something on a PCB, do a repair or something like that where I need to cover some exposed copper or sometimes this works really well, a drop of this to act like a mechanical support for a thin bodge wire. So it's nice to have them in different colors for a very clean end result uh, no matter the solder mask color of the PCB I'm working on. Next up, I have an assortment of these uh, through-hole slow-blow fuses. 
well, not actually an assortment because I didn't get all of the available values, just three values in here, 500 milliamps, one amp and 1.25 amps. But these will be the most commonly encountered uh, values in the input section of small compact switch mode power supplies. These are AliExpress fuses, so do take these uh, ratings um, with a bit of caution, but given that they do come in this tape reel packaging option, and they do have markings for VDE testing and UL testing, they kind of inspire some level of confidence uh, if they went to the trouble. So I would dare to say these uh, look better than the common low quality unmarked fuses. Next, I have a countdown timer, which uh, can be useful in the kitchen or in the lab for stuff like UV curing, reflowing PCBs on a hot plate, or anything else that just needs a countdown timer and the um, user manual states that it can also count up like a stopwatch. This will take three uh, AAA batteries which are not included. It has this rather nice 7 inch uh, style display. The user interface is a little bit strange meaning you have to rotate to adjust time and it does have uh, velocity sensing. Uh, meaning if you rotate faster, it will start incrementing faster with higher numbers. But how do you select between seconds and minutes? Well, it seems that if you pause after rotating for minutes, uh, it will switch to adjusting the uh, seconds. There is also a buzzer with a uh, high, mid and low option and off option. Um, and there are some magnets on the back, but I would say they don't feel too strong. Overall, I would say this is decent value for $6 or so, which is this thing is selling for. So I'm pretty happy with the purchase. Next up, I have this five meter long drain cleaning brush. And this thing is typically advertised as a cleaning tool for automotive water drain. Like if you have a sunroof on your car, it will have some water drains which will get clogged up if you don't maintain them and you leave your car parked under trees too often. But obviously it can clean anything else similar and it's fairly inexpensive. So I decided to get one and uh, keep in my storage. For example, this might also be useful for cleaning some AC splitter uh, drainage systems. And also for cleaning purposes, I have this larger uh, advertised as horse hair brush with a plastic handle. This is excellent for cleaning any type of leather or textile car interiors, but not limited to that as the action of these softer horse hair brushes is, is likely suited for most cleaning applications where you don't want to inflict any damage to the surface. Next, I have some magnetic multimeter test leads and these come in a set of three. Uh, there's a red, a green and a black and they have this in a four millimeter banana socket uh, which you use to interface to your multimeter. And then the probes themselves are these uh, wider, weird looking magnetic terminals. So they advertise these as being used in an electrical panel ideal for um, attaching to the uh, screws on circuit breakers. Now obviously relying on such a, um, a magnetic contact is not ideal as the force applied can vary or it can be insufficient but I can certainly imagine myself using a set of these in a situation where I would leave the meter attached with these and then go back and uh, check maybe a different section of the circuit further away. So I thought it made sense to get a set and give them a try. So first off, you would be using some uh, insulated four millimeter banana jacks for these, but this is what I had at my workbench. Okay, yeah, it works. Like with the screws all the way uh, in, it, it doesn't jump around. It, even if I move this around, I jiggle it around, the uh, contact resistance is, is pretty stable. So I think these get a thumbs up from me. I think they'll be a useful addition to my toolbox. Next, I saw this little PoE detector module and I said to myself, this can be useful for wired network debugging 
I don't do a lot of that, but when I do, it's very useful to know if you have PoE active on that wire or not, especially if you're like 30 meters away from the switch or several floors away. So from the markings on this uh, tester, we learn it can detect if it's a passive or an 802.3 AF slash AT connection. It can distinguish from 24 volts and 48 volts and it can also identify reverse PoE which, also, which allows the downstream device to supply power to the upstream device. So let's give it a little test here. I have uh, three basic PoE injector devices here. These two are from Ubiquiti. This one is from Rack Wireless. So uh, let's give these a test. So I think this one is a passive 24 volts one. So green solid passive 24 volts. It correctly identified this one. This one is uh, an 802.3 AF uh, PoE injector and we get a solid blue uh, which indicates it's uh, still a passive but this time a 48 to 56 volt connection. Now I would have expected this to be in the flashing uh, category for an 802.3 uh, AF uh, PoE injector. I'm not sure if it's a problem with the PoE detector or with the injector itself not being identified in that category. And this one is also a passive 48 volt injector. And if we check out the label on this one, I got this with the rack wireless gateway. So I don't have any of the more advanced um, active PoE uh, injectors here so I can test with. What I can tell you so far is that at least for the basic PoE injectors it does detect uh, them accordingly if they're 24 or 48 volts. I'm not sure why for this one which should be 802.3AF I'm not sure why it's not correctly identifying that. And the final item shown in this video are these 18650 sodium ion batteries which took something like 8 weeks to be delivered to my address. Now if you're not familiar with these types of batteries they use sodium instead of lithium which makes them cheaper and safer than their lithium counterparts. Now if you try to buy these you'll notice they're not actually cheaper than 18650's lithium ions. They're actually more expensive but that's just due to the economy of scale. Right now they don't manufacture these at large scale and so especially through resale channels like AliExpress they do sell for a premium because there are not as many available. These should also be safe because they're less prone to catch fire or explosion and also importantly they should have longer cycle life. However, it's also important to consider their biggest downside which is the lower energy density. So while we can get lithium ion cells in 18650 format with capacities in excess of 3.5 amp hours, for these uh, sodium ion batteries we only typically get 1.3 amp hour per 18650 cells. So I just wanted to give these a try and have a set of them around just for the chemistry in case I need to design a circuit for a client at some point based on this chemistry. But if you do want to see me perform some testing on these, let me know in the comments. Let me know what you're interested in. For example, like putting a nail through one of these and seeing if it catches fire or not. Same as always, you'll find links for all of these items in the description below the video. That was all for today. I hope you found something interesting to order. And if you did, please let me know in the comments and I'll be catching you next time.